Welcome everyone, Costini here with a discussion about some of the hardest campaigns currently available in Immortal Empires. And when I say a hard campaign, I don't mean a hard campaign start. Because there are certainly campaigns that are very, very difficult early on. But once you get past, let's say, the first 10, 20 turns or so, and you stabilize the situation, they're not really that difficult when it comes to it. So the Empire, for instance, is a perfect example of this. Like, they can have a very difficult early game start as either Karl Franz or Gelt or Volkmar. But overall, the Empire is not what I'd consider a hard campaign. Nor is Kislev, actually. For all the issues Kislev has and for all, for all the problems they're going to have because of the devotion system, the invocation system, the supporter system... Um, for all those problems, once you get past the early game situation, once you deal with Frat, once you deal with Azazel, once you've stabilized the situation with Draca and Azak, you're not really going to have necessarily a very hard campaign overall. A pretty excruciating campaign to be sure, but not necessarily difficult. So the campaigns on this list are campaigns that are difficult beyond just like the first 10, 20 turns or so. So here we are again. Are we to pretend demons don't exist? What a sham of a list. What's the point in even talking about the demons, Carl? Everyone knows and accepts that they are all weak. So there's no value in adding them to such a list when five out of five campaigns could be all their lords easily. Whoever doesn't accept that, well, they might be drinking more Kool-Aid than I am. This list is an abomination, and it has earned a grudge from the start. Only a madman like you, Luther, could defend it. Oh, for Sigmar's sake, here we go. I suppose the only redeeming quality is that Malekith is on this list, and it's so fitting that this traitorous scum is here. It doesn't make sense. The Dark Elves are strong, and Malekith adds a lot of value to his faction. He rides a dragon, has powerful magic, and a plethora of powerful effects. What were you thinking in placing him here in the first place? You realize he's surrounded by enemies, right? And those enemies aren't so easily dealt with. Valkyr, Grombrindal as a start, and then Sigvald and the Doomtide of the High Elves in the long term. The territory in particular is horrible to navigate for him, so he'll waste precious time. Sounds like a skill issue. At number five, we have Malekith, the Witch King of the Dark Elves. Malekith is actually the weakest legendary lord of the Dark Elves. Yes, he does have some nice faction effects with the upkeep to uh, Bleak Swords, Dark Shards. The Dark Shard upkeep benefit uh, being very significant. Loyalty for new recruits, diplomatic relations. And he does have a pretty good skill line. The thing is about Malekith's campaign, however, is that he starts with Nagron. Yes, you can make a tier two very, very quickly. But the problem with Nagarond is the province where it's uh, in, the Iron Foothills, is a very exposed province. And it's not like you have friendly neighbors, no, you have some very hostile neighbors. You have Valka from the north, you have Grumbrindle to the west, uh, you have Tarox over here just a bit south, and then, of course, you have Alif Anar. Now, that's just the start of this campaign. But keep in mind, dealing with Valka, for Grumbrindle, Tarox to an extent can be a pretty significant issue in your campaign. But even once you overcome the early game situation, that's when a lot of the problems do really start kicking in. Because defeating Valkyrie early game, yeah, let's assume you can do it. It's a very difficult battle, but you do have the tools for it because you can get some pretty good armor-piercing units. Though it is worth pointing out, you don't start with the Black Arcs, and so you're going to be relying on Dark Shards without shields, which are going to be weaker against the Dwarves. And it's going to take you a couple of turns at the very least, like we're looking at five turns, to even be able to recruit Dark Shards with shields, or even getting the structure to be able to get a Black Arc. So your campaign start is going to be much slower, and having a slower campaign start can... Uh, certainly impact the entirety of your campaign. Now, in many campaigns that have a slow start, if you can overcome that uh, situation, you may have uh, some breathing space. The problem for Malekith is he doesn't have the breathing space. He's constantly going to be fighting enemies. Like, you can make a deal with Valkia by taking out Grant. It's pretty silly, by the way, declaring war on your Dark Elves and selling the territory to Valkia so, just, so you can just get some breathing space to deal with Grumbrindle. And by the way, annoying thing about Grumbrindle, his territory is unpleasant climate, so you're going to have to conquer a bunch of unpleasant climate to deal with. Though my advice would probably be to sell it to Katep to get an ally with him. But here's the issue in the long term. Because you have Sigvold over here, and believe it or not, Sigvold is actually the probably the most successful conqueror 
of the Warriors of Chaos AI. Because generally speaking, the Warriors of Chaos AI don't necessarily amount to much. I mean, they can conquer some territory, but they do struggle to get a significant amount of it. Well, Sigvald and quite a few campaigns I've been playing recently, he's generally made a fairly significant empire for himself because he has a bunch of dark fortresses next to him and he has no real opposition. There's no legendary lord that is going to contest him, so he can expand unopposed. It isn't uncommon for Sigvald to take a significant portion of the northern Cassic wastes. And guess who you're going to be dealing with throughout the course of your campaign? The one benefit in Malekith's situation is that he can take chaotic wasteland as territory with no penalties. That is a pretty a substantial benefit when it comes to this campaign. But having to deal with Valkyar, Grumbrindel, and Tarox in the early game, and then the mid game dealing with Sigvald, and then having the High Elven Death Tide unleashed on you. Not necessarily Alifanar himself, because Alifanar can be slowed down by Salostra, but the, and Hellebron, of course, who hates him. But the issue is going to be that by the time you've dealt with all of those issues, the Death Tide, the Doom Stacks from Ulf One are going to start arriving. And there's nothing worse than dealing with Ulf One, Alfarian, Alarial, Tyrion, even when you're a strong legendary lore, like, say, Grom the Paunch. There's nothing worse than dealing with that when they've taken over all of Wolf 1, and it's not like you can strike Wolf 1 so quickly to prevent them from becoming a mega power and them getting the Sword of Cain. That's your long-term prospects in the campaign, dealing with Tyrion, Alarion, and Alfarian, who are uh, going to throw a lot of things against you, and they're going to annihilate Morafi. Some campaigns Morafi does tend to do very well against them, uh, against them. But most of the campaigns I've seen on Legendary, Morafi tends to struggle. I mean, she does some damage, but then she ends up losing. So you're kind of on the clock as well to do very well in the early game. And then you have the Doomstacks of the High Elves to deal with. You do have a lot of advantages in the campaign, absolutely. But it is a pretty harsh campaign. Uh, to deal with, and actually the hardest Dark Elven campaign uh, by far. Here's the difference between Malekith and Hellebron. Hellebron, she can get two provinces very quickly. She can rush uh, Sigvald before he becomes an issue, and then she can let uh, Malekith deal with Valkyrie and Grumbrindle on that while she's dealing with Ali Fanar. So just starting a bit further to the east and having a much better starting province than uh, Nagaron itself. And Nagaron as a settlement's great, but the province it's in is pretty crappy. Whereas Hellebron has two provinces very quickly, or even three if you're counting Spiteful Peaks of, uh, within easy access for herself that she can get, so that's a lot of economic output. Significant differences. I, it really comes down to just the way the terrain is designed around here, and also the fact that mountainous climate is unpleasant, and you do have to deal with uh, the Skaven faction over here, you do have to deal with Grom Brindle in this campaign, so it can be a fairly unpleasant early game to tackle if you're playing as Malakov. There are multiple ways of dealing with this, you could either just deal with the Skaven and Harkaldra, maybe make a deal with Grom Brindle temporary so you can deal, focus on Valkia, but regardless of what you do, you're gonna have a rough time during the course of this campaign. Whoever decided to place me and my kin on this list has earned my unending hatred. When I find who they are, they will get a list of grudges so long they will eclipse Skarsnik. Once again, the dwarves don't fail to disappoint. What is that vampire scum? Do you not have enough grudges to your name? He is right. Dwarves have what? A weak early economy, expensive units, and many enemies that far outclass them. And you, Thorgrim, are in the worst position of all of them. You! You dare! The old alliance is broken, human. We shall have vengeance for this insult. Mark my words, your skull will decorate my throne room. How quaint. I wonder how you will do any decorating when the greenskins and ratmen descend on your precious capital in force and decide to decorate it with your skull. Never argue with a dwarf. They will bring you down to their level of stupidity. And number four, we have Thorgrim Grudgebird, the leader of the dwarves, the high king of the dwarves. Now, initially, his campaign seems promising. Yes, he only starts with the tier one settlement, and it's going to take him uh, five turns again to be able to get any kind of good units like quarrelers, for instance, or artillery. But the thing is about his campaign start, it's actually deceptively easy. You might think, oh, it's very easy. You just come in here, you fight a bunch of battles manually, and you easily take over this entire province and then take over Dead Rock Gap and defeat Skarsnik. Because what happens here is if you move quickly enough, you can actually take down Skarsnik when he just takes the high place and his army is vulnerable. In fact, you can defeat Skarsnik so quickly 
that you might fail to get the Master Rune of Spite over here because the grudge is pretty broken. But here's the thing. The early game is not really an issue for Fulgrim's campaign. The issue is what comes after. So over here, Deadrock Gap is vulnerable to attack by Clan Rectus. So you're likely going to be dealing with that as well. But here's the problem in this campaign, or one of the problems. And there's many, uh, many issues in this campaign uh, when you look at it. To the south, you have Clan Vermin. Now, Clan Vermin isn't necessarily going to amount to much, though they are a potential uh, threat. But the real threat are the Scampi Eye and Warzak. So what Warzak is going to do, he's going to take this entire province, then he's going to march north, deal with the Scampi Eye or make a deal with them, then take Bark Var. Now, if you try and inter uh, intervene, that's going to be a hell of a fight and your territory here, and you're not going to be able to commit to dealing with Clan Rectus properly. If you ignore Bark Var, it's going to fall and you're going to uh, end up having Warzak show up at the doorstep of your capital with full stacks. Now, that's a fight you can win, because the garrison of Karak uh, uh, is a fairly substantial garrison. But you're going to be dealing with Clan Rectus, and then Karakazul is going uh, to fall. So your long-term prospects, your mid-game and your late-game, you're going to be dealing with Warzag, you're going to be dealing with Queek, eventually Scarbrand during the course of this campaign, and of course Clan Rectus. The problem is... Uh, the problem is that you're exposed on multiple sides from a lot of enemies, and those enemies can flank you around your main expansion path. Because what you'd want to do in this campaign, take the Silver Road, take the Drag Gap. Well, if you just ignore the Drag Gap, the World Edge Archway is vulnerable to, uh, to uh, Clan Rectus. Uh, if you try and intervene in Barak Var, then enemies come in from here. The only flank that's secure is actually the North, because Ungram will defeat these orcs. But even then, you also have to conserve Vlad, who might be an issue, and he's going to wipe out Zofbar. And you kind of want to confederate these dwarves, because these dwarves do have their unique lords uh, that can be useful in the campaign. So if you can get uh, Karakazul uh, before it gets wiped out, or Zofbar uh, in a confederation before they get wiped out, you can get some pretty useful lords in your campaign. But there's plen uh, plenty of issues over here. Uh, when it comes to specifically the mid-game portion of this campaign, not the early game. Now, if you overcome all of that, if you deal with Queek, if you deal with Warzag, if you deal with Tretch Craventhal, um, you then have other issues. You'll still have to deal with Vlad. You'll still have to deal with Scarbrand and any other enemies that come in from the south like Malagor. And then eventually, in the real long term, you're going to be dealing with the Death Tide, that is Grimgore Ironhide, descending on your territory with significant armies once you've established an, your empire. So that is a pretty hard fight that Forgrim does have. He has a lot of enemies uh, early on, potentially, even though the very f uh, first few turns of the campaign might seem deceptively easy, but it's not really an easy campaign in a lot of ways. Then you also have Scrag, potentially, to uh, to deal with. Though Scrag is more of uh, annoyance than an actual threat, because between Belagar and uh, and Gelt, uh, Scrag is going to get wiped out uh, fairly quickly in his campaign. But you do have a lot of issues. And the problem with the Badlands in general, for any campaign that starts in it, is it's very exposed, it's very easy to get territories that are undefended to get attacked, to get them sacked, to lose them, while your armies are marching elsewhere. And the dwarves are actually pretty poor at dealing with it, because dwarves can't maintain as many armies as, say, the High Elves or Dark Elves or Greenskins can. Like, a Greenskin campaign or a Vampire Counts campaign doesn't have these issues, because they can maintain a lot of armies individually powerful. The dwarves do have powerful armies, but they're limited in number, just because of the sheer cost of every single unit. Uh, in, in particular, not the recruitment cost, but the upkeep cost. It's not like dwarves have an unlimited source of money. Like a regular quarreler is 138. And you're dealing with units that may be just as good or slightly weaker uh, than you. And you're also dealing with a lot of them. Because Warzak, he's going to throw free full stacks against your hide. Uh, Queek, same deal. Tretch, if you let uh, Tretch build up, he's going to do the same thing. So that is the issue uh, to deal with. Those are the issues to deal with in this campaign. If you overcome that, yeah, you can become a powerhouse, and I would say that Forgrim has probably the highest potential, or one of the highest potential for the dwarves in his campaign, but it is certainly a hard campaign to deal with. At number three, we have Cetra the Imperishable. Now, the Tomb Kings are a powerful race, and they can have a lot of power in the mid and late game if you can overcome their early game, but the problem is 
for Setra, his early game might as well be his mid game in terms of how long it's going to take. Let's go over the issues of this campaign, the benefits. Like, you do have a construction benefit, you do have a growth benefit, you have a powerful skill line, etc. And in theory, you have a great position to dominate all of Camry. The problem is you don't really have the tools for it because it's a large swath of territory and you only have one army for the first 14 turns. 14 turns is basically the entirety or the vast majority of the early game and your early game is not going to be easy. So you have Numas, they're very easy to deal with, sure, fair enough. The problem is this, once you deal with Numas, you then have the Brotherhood over here and they're going to throw a full stack of troops, maybe even more at you uh, by the time you're capable of dealing with them and it's not like you can just rush them so easily i mean i guess you could decide in instead of taking numas you could just march cetera take down uh, uh take down this army here start recruiting over here next to camry and then go deal with these guys very very early on but it is a hell of a fight that you will have on your hands the problem that Cetra has in his campaign is he never catches a break for a very very long period of time because this is just the starting situation these two enemies and then of course you're also at war with Ark and the Black but it's gonna take him a long time to actually get to you the issue is once you deal with Numas and the Brotherhood things don't get easier you have Scarbrand to the north and Numas is exposed so this territory might be raised to the ground continuously Prevent you from taking full advantage of the entire province that you have in the land of the dead, and you don't necessarily have, uh, you don't necessarily have the tools to be able to defend it, uh, because even when you get the second army, you're gonna have other work to do, uh, other work for that army. This is the kind of campaign where if you're starting, and my strong advice is make sure you randomize. Uh, the books like start this campaign again and again and again until what you get is the fifth book of Nagash in this case It's spawned in Wolf One, but make sure you get the fifth books uh, of Nagash and Lamia now consider that starting situation So you got two factions to deal with then you have to march all the way here in the best possible scenario Fight another faction in a siege battle with just one army That's not necessarily gonna be a very powerful army just to get the book that's randomly spawned and even then, you're still going to have a hell of an issue because even then, even in that situation where you can get free armies very quickly in your campaign, let's say by uh, turn 14, you're still going to have to deal with Scarbrand, you're still going to have to deal with Manfred, you're still going to have to deal with Volkmar, and then other issues in the long term. The bigger problem is the jungle situation to the south, because to the north you have hostile factions, to the west you have Arkan, to the south you have Tic-Tac-Toe. Now, Tic-Tac-Toe is extremely hostile towards basically all of his neighbors, and he's certainly hostile towards you. So are the Bowmen of Orion, so is Forek, so you're going to potentially have to deal with all of these guys as well. And a reminder, you have Scarbrand in the north, and actually dealing with Scarbrand can be a pain in the neck as well. And then you have either Rapunzel or Arkan or both of them to deal with the west. And Tic-Tac-Toe, he's a genuine harasser. And this territory is spread enough that it's hard to defend all of this uh, all of this territory that you have over here. And in order to win the campaign, you actually need to take all of Camry. Because in order to achieve your long campaign victory condition, you need to do it. Though, you may not, uh, you, you may put that off for a bit, stabilize the situation in the north, and then deal with Tic-Tac-Toe. But yeah, Tic-Tac-Toe, if you're playing as Volkmar, or if you're playing as Cetra, or pretty much any faction that encounters him, he's very likely going to declare war on you. He's not necessarily too much of a threat, but when you're surrounded by enemies that constantly harass you and you've got such an exposed and open-ended territory, you need a lot of armies to be able to properly defend it. And Tomb Kings do need territory to be able to get their units, uh, to increase their unit caps. Well, when you have so much territory, it you would need a lot of armies. Like, Manfred is actually the best one to deal with the situation because he can get those multiple armies and dominate his enemies. But Volkmar, Cetra, they're in a really rough situation, especially Cetra, because he only has one army for those first, first 14 turns. And even when he gets that additional army, he's got so much on his plate that it's going to be a very difficult campaign. Now, eventually, once you deal with Tic-Tac-Toe, once you've de dealt with this situation here, stabilize the front line, yeah, you can steamroll your enemies because you'll have a lot of territory, a lot of provinces, a lot of provincial effects, but damn, those first 50, 60, 70 turns are 
absolutely miserable to deal with in a campaign just because you're surrounded by enemies you have very few allies and even the allies that you have even the people that would be our natural allies you don't actually want them as allies because you need their territory to be able to achieve your long campaign victory condition so for instance you can make an alliance with this particular dynasty but the problem is you need their pyramid in order to achieve your long campaign victory condition and you can't confederate other tomb kings which is a bit of a shame you could make a deal with Kalida, but she's way over here and making a deal with her might just put you in conflict with Queek might put you in conflict with some other factions so hey even more enemies to deal with I've played the campaign and etc it was non it felt like non-stop firefighting like constantly fires would pop up be it from Forek from Manfred from Volkmar from Tic-Tac-Toe and of course the long campaign situation where yeah you do want to wipe out Arkhan actually dealing with Arkhan is a short campaign victory situation like, consider the factions you just have to defeat for your short campaign victory condition, and you might understand uh, the issue. Lots of potential in the uh, in the very long game, absolutely, undeniably so, etc. has a lot of power, he has a good skill line, he has a great deal of power, but that early game, that mid game, the, pretty much the entirety of the campaign, until you get to that point where you steamroll, is just going to be pretty awful. And another thing to add on top of this, beca because of the starting position, you have a lot of endgame crises next to you. So regardless of which one you get, the only one that you can't get, the only one that you can get that won't affect you is actually the Skaven one. And even then, that still will affect you because you have Queek all, all, all the way here. That's close enough to affect you, but not so much. But you have the Nagash endgame crisis spawns at the Black Baron of Nagash. The Vampire one spawns Manfred over here. The Wood Elf one spawns in Orion's camp. The Do uh, Dwarf one spawns in Karak Zorn. So you have a lot of endgame crises right next to you as well in your core territory to screw you over even more so it's not like you escape the issues in a campaign and even in the very long term because you have a lot of enemies to deal with even in that situation and god forbid you've played this uh, with the ultimate endgame crisis because that can be genuine misery in this campaign for two we have greece's gold tooth of the ogres now the ogres have a lot of issues because of their camps because of their economy because how long it takes for them to actually grow now the potential of growth is there and if an ogre campaign was starting in some nice corner of the map then there would be a lot of potential for them but they don't start in the corner of the map neither greases or scrag do so and greases in particular is kind of screwed over because of his campaign uh, situation in more ways than one early on you might see a lot of opportunities a lot of caravans pass through here you can raid them to get to, uh, to get a lot of money but that might not necessarily be the best decision because you're actually close enough to cafe over here that if you start raiding their caravans, they might just start sending doom stacks against you. And that's actually one of the last things you want to deal with it, with this. I mean, you could raid the river lords, sure. Uh, and you can raid the celestial uh, loyalists, no problem. Maybe the rebels over here. But outside of that, if you if you start raiding the western provinces or the northern provinces or the nomads, do expect the burning no, uh, uh, nomads do expect their armies to actually show up in your territory. So you can't even take advantage of the caravan situation as well as you might uh, want to. Another issue. Uh, the early game, relatively simple when it comes to enemies, except the dwarves who will have a pretty powerful army, though, is a difficult fight you have against them, and Greasus' uh, quest battle is not necessarily easy either, but it's something you can deal with. The problem is what comes shortly thereafter, because af right after you get past the early game, let's say you've ca uh, captured some provinces, you've stabilized your economy, you're getting multiple armies, you're expanding, well, right after that, you're going to encounter Gorst. And Gorst is almost certainly going to declare war on you. You could delay it by uh, taking Flayed Rock for yourself and selling it to Gorst, but you're not going to be able to prevent Gorst from declaring war on you. You're just going to delay it. The problem is you either end up in a war with Gorst or you end up in a war with Yao Ming. And neither of those choices is a particularly great one, to be very clear. Because Yao Ming and Gorst don't like each other, so if you make the deal with Gorst, for instance, who, by the way, hates you, you're likely going to end up in a war with Yao Ming or, and, or some other cafe and faction. So that is already a problem. And Gorst has an army that's very well suited to counter you, because the ogres... The way the Ogre army works, they're an army based on doing a lot of initial damage and charging constantly due to the Ogre charge. Well, Gorse doesn't care. He regenerates HP, his zombies have a lot of HP, they can survive the damage and can heal it up. Actually defeating Gorse in a one-on-one -on -one fight, even with a Doomstack, 
Like, let me just say this. You can throw an entire army of Iron Guts against Gorst with his zombies, and Gorst might actually win that particular fight. So, that is a rough time. And then, of course, you've got Kugaf, who is another fight that's difficult to deal with. For all the memory can, that can surround uh, the Demons of Chaos, the reality is Kugaf can be something of an issue to deal with when you're playing as Greases. As any other faction that surrounds Kugaf, he's a joke, but Greases actually it can be hard countered uh, by uh, Kugaf. But those are not the real issues of this campaign. Not Xiao Ming, not, uh, not Gorse, not Kugaf. No, those are just the beginning of your issues because it gets worse, far worse, as you progress through this campaign. To the west, you would have two factions that can be a genuine problem. One is Imric. And Imric, like, Imric is not necessarily... Imric is probably the worst legendary lord of the High Elves, but he's still a High Elven legendary lord, so he's really powerful. In fact, of the High Elven legendary lords, all of them, with the exception of Elif Anar, who just has way too many enemies on his plate, all of them uh, create pretty powerful empires, or all of them survive for a very long period of time, even if they don't conquer much, like Teclis, for instance. But Imric is absolutely insane, because although he may not have the most powerful armies overall, the one army that he has, his own army, is insane. And he personally can defeat the entire armies on his own. He's got a lot of regeneration, a lot of resistances, very difficult to take down. He's kind of like Tyrion with the Sword of Cain, basically. That's kind of how it feels to deal with Emmerich in a fight. He is absolutely insane. I mean, he has a lot of issues in his campaign. We'll get to him in just a second. But um, that's just one problem. And then, of course, there's Stretch Craventel, which is another issue. Because you're going to have to face multiple stacks of Skaven. But even Emmerich, even when you add Emmerich to Gorse, to Kugaf, to Xiao Ming, even that's not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is found way over here Grimgor see the thing about Grimgor is if you're going to be dealing with him in a campaign you want to buffer you want some defensible terrain the dwarves have issues dealing with uh, Grimgor but they have enough space between themselves and him that they can build defenses on you know the passes like silver pinnacle over here or world edge archway and by the time they do encounter Grimgor if you're playing as Ungrim or Forgrim or even Belagar um, you'll have powerful enough armies to counter him. The ogres have very slow growth, so it takes them a long time, like much longer than most other factions, to actually get to, uh, uh, to the level where they can afford tier 3 units, proper armies, beyond just relying on Noblars and Ogre Bolts. Well, Grimgor is a greenskin. Greenskins themselves are pretty insane to deal with on the campaign because they can afford a lot of armies, and they have war armies as well. You're pretty much going to be dealing with permanent Wa armies coming from Grimgor. Now, there's a way to deal with the Wa armies. You can kill the army or a specific model within a unit of that Wa army, the unit that's leading it, basically the leader. If you kill that and you retrieve from the battlefield, then you can fight the battle without having to deal with the Wa army. But even then, even without the Wa armies, even if you cheese it like that, it's still a substantial amount of power. Like, Grimgor has good range units. He's got good melee units. He's one of the best, if not the best, duelist in the entire game. And you get to deal with him, not early on like Kolek. Like, Kolek can just easily deal with him because Kolek can just rush him. No, you don't have that kind of luxury in your campaign. You get to deal with Grimgor pretty much at the height of his power. And there's a reason why Grimgor conquers the, entire, uh, the entirety of the Mountains of Morn in virtually every campaign. That's because he has no real opposition that can stop him. All the ogre factions in the north, they're no match for Grimgor. The best you can do in this campaign is try and delay coming into conflict with Grimgor by not making any deals with any of the factions that he borders. But that's all that's going to earn you is a delay, a reprieve. It's not going to stop Grimgor from declaring war on you. And when he declares war on you... The more you wait, the stronger he'll be, and he is much stronger in a fight than uh, than uh, Greases. Greases has a lot of issues. Like, his combat ability, like, Greases has some nice faction benefits in his skill line, but he's pretty damn worthless in battle. So you don't have anyone to take uh, Grimgor out in a duel. Your army's not suitable for uh, hero killing. So you're going to have a lot of issues dealing with just Grimgor, let alone all the armies that Grimgor uh, does have. My advice would be to try and tar pit Grimgor, keep him occupied while your army defeats the enemy army. And then you'll get to deal with Grimgor again and again and again, doing vast damage in any battle that you're fighting. Can be pretty annoying to deal with that. 
And if you do manage to overcome that, congratulations, you've probably beaten one of the hardest campaigns in the entire game if you can just defeat Grimgore. And it's not like it necessarily gets easier later down the line because then you have, you know, chaos uh, and other factions uh, to deal with. But if you can overcome all of that, yeah, maybe you can have a very, a very easy, uh, like, turn 100 plus end game situation if you manage to survive that. Though, bear in mind, you do have an end game crisis with Gorse right next to you. Uh, that's something to deal with, and you have, of course, the Greenskin Endgame Crisis uh, via Grimgore. So enjoy that particular campaign situation. And number one, we have Emmerich. Now, the rankings on this list are based on the poll results uh, in the community poll that I did. Now, I personally would not have put Emmerich at the top of this list. I would have put him high up on this list, absolutely, but not at the very top. That doesn't mean he has a good campaign, but it's not quite as bad as, uh, as Greece's. Though you still will have to deal with actually many of the same issues Greases will have to deal with. Okay, first off, let's talk about one of the very annoying things with this campaign. You have an opportunity to confederate Kalidor, but you basically need to not take the Bone Gulch on the first settlement. So you just sack it, you deal with this army, you sack it, you put in camp stands, you wait for a second turn for the objective to spawn. And then you sack it again. You don't occupy it. On the first turn, you get the se uh, secondary army over here. I've done a whole guide for Emmerich early game. But suffice it to say, it is annoying as hell. But you want to do it in a particular way because you want to get Confederation with Kalidor very quickly before Noctilus wipes them out. And then you want to sell Kalidor to Tyrion. The reason Kalidor is so important to get in Emmerich's campaign is because it gives you vision with Tyrion much earlier on than you can get it otherwise. There is a quest battle that can give you vision otherwise, but is slower than just getting Kalidor confederating it and then selling it uh, to Tyrion and establishing diplomatic relations with Tyrion, Alfarian, and Alariel for trading in particular, which you will need, because otherwise you're gonna run out of money in this campaign pretty damn quickly. Here's the problem though of, uh, of this particular campaign. The early game is miserable, but doesn't necessarily get better. You do have an incredibly powerful army between uh, Emmerich's dragon, his skill line, his items. You do have an amazing level of power during this particular campaign. Like if we look uh, at um, at the quest item, uh, he actually starts with the Star Lance. The Star Lance has a good amount of power. Uh, then you have the armor of Kalidor, which uh, gives you even more power, like the Vigor loss reduction alone is insanely good that you do have here. You have a lot of fire resistance as well uh, when it comes uh, when it comes to him, as well as some uh, as well as a pretty decent uh, level of power that he does uh, have uh, have access to. He's basically impossible to kill in a lot of ways just because of the stats that he has um, that he can get uh, access to over here. So Emmerich, really hard to, to take down, and God forbid if he gets a regeneration, he is not going down uh, during uh, the course of, of this campaign. Like, he gets a lot of war save, he has a lot of power, he can do a lot of damage, he can survive a lot of damage. Generally, lords that are large, or riding large mounts, can be vulnerable. Not Emmerich. No, 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 not Emmerich. But here's the problem. Beyond the initial issues with Kalidor, to the west you have Queek, and Queek is like your annoying neighbor, and the problem is you have a pretty powerful Skaven faction over here in this particular settlement, so you can't take this province, which means that this province is always going to be an uh, open pathway into your own territory for Queek, and yes, Queek is going to declare war on you. You don't have any friendly neighbors. I mean, you could make an alliance eventually with Karakazul, but they don't particularly like you, and they're going to be wiped out by Queek. Then you have Tretch Craventel to the north, which you basically have to deal with in the early game. And, of course, you have the mega issue of Grimgor, who is going to be at full power by the time you face him. And he's likely going to conquer the entirety of the Mountains of Morn. Even if you try and rush Grimgor and ignoring everything else, like Queek, Scarbrand, Malagor to the west, all of which can be problems in your campaign, you're still going to have a hell of a challenge dealing with Grimgor. And, of course, you have Gorst as well. To deal with now it's nowhere near as bad as Greece's situation but being surrounded by enemies having enemies to the west having enemies to the north having enemies to the east all of which are pretty powerful can be a significant issue in this campaign you have one very powerful army but one powerful army is not really enough to deal with an area the size of the Darklands that you deal with or even the Badlands you're also str going to struggle with navigation. This is a similar issue that uh, Greece has in that 
they're in areas that are ideal for Android movement. Like a Leaf and R in this starting position would do very well, but of course a Leaf and R's lore perspective is that he wants to kill the Dark Elves. Um, but you not having the ability to use the Android means that your enemies can and will run in circles around you because they can use the Android. Grimgor can use the Android, Kree can use the Android, every mi Miner Skaven and Greenskin faction can and will use the Android to run in circles around you. So I would recommend using Ambush Stance. And here's the thing about this campaign. Beyond the initial situation, beyond the early game, the mid game, all that kind of stuff, yeah, you need to deal with Borzag, you need to deal with Clan Moors, you need to deal with Scarbrand. Have fun. So your, your campaign is going to push you west while you have uh, the Doom Tide coming in from the north. That you're, you're, The campaign is basically saying ignore the issues that you're going to have in the long term, um, long term coming in from the north, just focus on the west. I would say Emmerich's campaign is far easier in Warhammer 3 than it was in Warhammer 2, but that's because in Warhammer 2, he started right next to Snitch, and Snitch is like an insane level of threat, and you can you didn't have any trading partners, and you can trade with Wolfwan. Now you can trade with Wolfwan, and you don't have Snitch right next to you, so you do have a buffer, it's a much easier campaign, but it's still one of the hardest campaigns to deal with. And unlike a Leaf and Nar, I would say it's not really an enjoyable campaign either because a Leaf and Nar works very well in terms of his campaign because, yes, he has a hard campaign, sure, but he has all the tools needed to deal with it. You don't. There lies the problem. Anyway, that's all there is to it. Costine here signing out. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and enable notifications, and stay tuned for more. If you do enjoy the content, consider donating via PayPal, Patreon, or for YouTube channel membership. It does help keep me going.